you can certainly do this yourself. I was mentioning that, you know, for some reason, folks, when they look at 129, say, oh, you know, but oh, the top hydraulics, you know, despite the fact that every other Mercedes since then has all, also used top hydraulics, and you never hear people complaining about them. But my point is, it's just not that big a deal to change these hydraulic cylinders. On the grand scheme of difficulty for jobs, it's probably moderate level difficulty, maybe a little moderate plus, but there's a lot more awful things to do. I'm gonna try changing the alternator bushings on a 6.3 with the engine in the car. So more about my background. I mentioned I'm not a professional. I, I am a, uh, a retired uh, career Naval officer. When I was in the Navy, I had the qualification for supervision, operation, and maintenance of Navy nuclear propulsion plants. And I try to apply kind of nuclear maintenance principles to car maintenance, which I think goes pretty well. So as far as replacing your top cylinders, I'm going to talk about, you know, kind of what I've learned. I'm also going to talk about some of the things I screwed up. The, uh, but you should not be afraid of that. I, the first time you do this, you will be so focused on doing it by the procedure and making sure everything goes right that you will not have a problem the first time. I didn't have any problems the first or the second time. And when I got a little complacent and started trying to do things a little bit differently, and I ran into a couple of issues that I will talk about so that you can kind of watch out for them. Now, my strategy on this is to remove the cylinders and either send them off to, to rebuild to a company called Top Hydraulics, which does an exceptional job, or maybe preferably uh, order by car, core exchange where they send you an already rebuilt set of cylinders and you put them in and send your cylinders back and then they refund your core charge. And they charge you a little bit extra for that, but I uh, much prefer doing it that way. Okay, now why should you do this yourself? <clears throat> And I started doing a lot of my do-it-yourself things because it took time is my most precious commodity, even now while I'm retired. And the time to go drop off a car and pick it up, uh, for many jobs, I can actually just do the job in that period of time. And it's an aspect of caring about your car. And no one really cares about the car the way you do. And of course, when you do it yourself, you always know who to blame. But it also helps you learn about your car. You can undo things that you find that were not done properly by the previous folks. And as I get older, I also think that working on your car and solving difficult problems helps to maintain your mental acuity. And I think with our demographic of our club, uh, that's, I think, pretty important. Now, I want to warn you, do not, do not take your car to a Mercedes dealer to get this job done. If you do that, what will happen is you'll get charged a lot of money, but they'll order a new cylinder and the new cylinder may have been sitting on the shelf for a long time. And these things probably have a shelf life of about 10 years or so. And so you can end up with a car with totally new cylinders where the cylinders fail pretty quickly because they're already pretty old when they go onto the car. One of my cars was uh, said to have had the cylinders changed, so we did not have proof of that. And I've ended up changing most of the cylinders since that period of time. And I suspect that's what happened. Okay, now we are having a little bit of conversation about the, the issue, and this is gonna be the most contentious piece and you can take from it what you will, but the typical comment on these is that when one goes bad, you need to replace all of them. And there's some circumstances where that's probably the right thing to do. If you're paying somebody to do it, then most people, most uh, shops will want to do all of them at the same time so that you don't end up bringing it back to them with another leak in cylinder soon. Um, peace of mind for the, if you're extremely risk averse, if you're extremely risk averse, you probably won't be doing this by yourself anyway. But uh, you know, if you're extremely risk averse and never wanna have one of these cylinders leak, yeah, maybe you just wanna do them all. I don't think they actually all wear at the same rate though. For example, I've not seen many to no, leaking to no lift or to no lock cylinders. And uh, I've seen a fair amount of main cylinders and bow extension cylinders. So I, I don't really think they fail at the same rate. 
So my guidance and my thought on this is that you do all the ones, when you have a leaker, you do all the ones that require the same amount of interference removal. And I say that because working on 129s and 124 cabriolets, there are a number of plastic interior pieces and I'm always worried about screwing up an interior piece or breaking a plastic piece. And I never wanna take one off if I don't actually have to. And so I really try to stay with the same amount of interference and just do all the ones that require that interference removal. The other thing I'll comment on though, is that for the main cylinders and the bow retract extend cylinders, you have to move the top during the repair to gain access. And when you're moving the top manually, think about where the hydraulic oil has to go. You know, there's, you got cylinders with oil in them and the ones that aren't leaking, you're moving the top around and the oil has to go somewhere. And if it doesn't leak out the, the rod seal, it's gotta go around the piston. And I'm a little suspicious that sometimes moving the top may take a marginal cylinder and make it start leaking. And you have to move it the most when you do the main cylinders and the bow extend retract cylinders. And so I may defer if I'm doing one of those cylinders, I may do all four of those. But like I say, I really prefer just doing the ones that require the same amount of interference removal and that's worked out pretty well for me. Okay, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do a screen share and let's show you some pictures. So let me get back to where I can see the screen share button. And I'm gonna share that screen there. And when I'm doing screen share, I can't see what you're seeing. So I have to ask you, can you see a diagram here that looks like, uh, hey Ruben, let me know. Can you see a diagram of the top cylinders? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, you should have seen this on the top hydraulic site. This kind of tells you where all the cylinders are. And let me just talk through kind of level of difficulty on these cylinders. Now, and see my, hopefully you can see my little arrow here, but the, uh, the to know lift cylinders back here are probably about the easiest, but you have to take out a little bit of interference, the trunk liner to do them. The to know lock cylinders are probably the easiest to get at and they're the easiest to take off. The only complication with that is if you only have the cylinder, then you have to pull them out of the lock. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. That's not that big a deal either but it complicates it a bit. And the same for the bow latch cylinders back here, the bow lock cylinders, they also have to come out of the lock and they take the same amount of interference removal that the to no lift cylinders that are back here in the trunk. And so I do these two at the same time. I do these two at the same time, the, the main cylinder and the bow extension cylinders. The windshield lock cylinders or the front lock cylinders are quite easy. One piece of interference has to be removed and they're right there in front of you. Now, so let me just show you a few pictures. This is looking at the right front of the trunk with the interference uh, of the cover removed. And what you see here, this first one is the tonneau lift cylinder. And the second one back here is the bow lock cylinder. The presence of the fuel filler makes this a little bit more challenging. The to know lift cylinder is easy to get out. The bow lock can be a little bit more challenging on the right side. And if you notice this little red tab here, this shows you it's a 94 or earlier car. This is the car that has the, the tab on it to be able to lock with your tool. And since that sticks out a little farther, it's a little bit more challenging to get that one out. Here's a closer look at the same picture. This is the tonneau lift cylinder here, and this is the bow lock cylinder in its lock over here. Just, this is a tonneau lock cylinder. This is easily accessible when the bow is up and the tonneau cover is up. And this is two bolts and two hydraulic lines and it's out. This is the windshield cylinder and the distribution manifold. And there's one, there's another windshield lock cylinder on the other side as well. You can see this is in a lock. This is pretty easy to get out. The issue might be that 
wiggling these lines around might cause the lines on the distribution manifold to leak. And then you'd have to replace that as well. I have not done that. Dean Prince has. So if you want to talk about that, I'll ask him to talk about that a little bit later. And this is looking down into where the main cylinder and the bow cylinder is. This is the left side of the car looking forward into the, into the tonneau cover area. Down here, you're looking at the main cylinder, which is a big cylinder that goes pretty much vertically down to the bottom of the car. Just forward of that, this is the bow uh, retract cylinder, extend retract cylinder. And what you're really seeing is the micro switch. This is the left side one, and it's got a micro switch sitting on it. And you see these three screws that hold the micro switch on. I'll come back to that because you've got to be careful not to break this micro switch. And I have broken this micro switch before. Okay. All right. This is the position that you use to inspect the cylinders. Now, if you're doing as before we started, Ruben discussed a little bit and I asked about buyer's guide. If you're looking to buy one of these cars, put the top in this position and you can inspect either nine or 10 cylinders in this position. Of course, the trunk doesn't have to be open for this. I just happen to have had it for this picture. And to get into this position with the top up, you just pull back on the top control and watch that the bow has come up and then the tonneau has come up and then just release the switch and it'll stay in this position and gives you great access to look at 10 cylinders or nine. I say 10 or nine because the later cars only have one to no lock and the, the earlier cars have to no locks on both sides. So do the, doing this inspection, looking back on the right side of the car, this is the, the left one is the bow latch cylinder and you see there's no oil sitting in here. This cylinder is not leaking. Looking over here, this is the tonneau lift cylinder and there's a puddle of oil retained right in here. This cylinder is leaking. It may not be leaking enough to hinder the top operation, but you need to change it. And this, is, this one's pretty easy to change too. And the other thing about this one, if you're doing the bow latch cylinder over here, you have to take off the upper end of this one, the tonneau lift cylinder anyway, so you might as well do that one too. Okay, this is looking down at the right side main cylinder. And you, this is the right side main cylinder. And then up here, you can see the bow extension cylinder. And there is a big puddle of oil right here. In this car in particular, I had somebody else with me and I was able to have them actuate the top mechanism while I looked at this. And this leak was so big that the top wouldn't operate and got to where it needed to actuate the main cylinder and then it just stopped. But I could see fluid squirting out right here on this one. Now this can be deceiving because if you see fluid in the main cylinder like this, it can be the main cylinder or it can be the bow extend retract cylinder, this cylinder up here. The bow extend retract cylinder, when the top's operating, changes from vertical to a horizontal position. And any oil that's leaking from this one, which is pretty hard to see, will drip down and it'll end up on top of the main cylinder here. And so you see this oil, it can either be the main cylinder or the bow extend retract cylinder. So you gotta be careful about that. But if you follow my guidance, You'd, you would change both of these anyway because they both require the same amount of interference removal. Okay, go to another one. So a little bit more about diagnosis. Looking at this diagram, it's pretty easy to see where the oil is going to end up if you have leaking cylinders and you end up with a puddle. If you have the bow, extend retract cylinder or the main cylinder leaking, the puddle is gonna be in front of the rear wheels. And you see just by the proximity of where the cylinders are. If you've got a, a bow lock or a tonneau lift cylinder leaking, the puddle is gonna be behind the wheels. If you've got a front, i.e. windshield cylinder leaking, the puddle is on your knee, passenger knee or driver's knee 
uh, while you're driving the car. It's a little irritating. Now, one caveat on that is that the 129's spare tire well is offset to the right side of the car. One thing that can happen, especially if the right to no lift cylinder is leaking, and I think it can probably happen for the right side bow lock cylinder, is that the oil will drip down and it can get into the spare tire well and then it'll drip out of the drain on the spare tire well. And so you'll see a puddle under the middle of the car instead of behind the rear wheel. And that's pretty unusual, uh, but it, it can be an indication of the right side, you know, one of these two cylinders, to no lift or bow lock. Okay, so the other piece of di diagnosis is where does the top stop? If, if the cylinder is really leaking badly, this, the top will stop operating when it gets to that cylinder. So it's important to understand the operational sequence of the top to help you diagnose that if you need to. And of course the puddles, puddles sometimes help, but you know, not all of these cylinders are gonna fail with an external leak. It is physically possible to have an internal leak so that the oil bypasses the, the piston. And you won't get an external leak from that. I've never seen it, but it can it can physically happen. And so you need to know the, the top sequence to diagnose that. Okay, so here we're starting with windows up, bar up, that is roll bar up and top shut. And then we actuate the switch. First thing that happens is the windows go down. And that's one of your test pieces. If the windows don't first go down, then you've got a control uh, unit issue instead of a uh, top hydraulics issue. Okay, so the first thing that happens here then, once the, the windows go down, the roll bar goes down, the bow unlatches and the bow retracts. The next thing that happens is the tonneau unlatches and then the tonneau goes op open. Next, the main cylinders actuate, the, wind the windshield locks unlock and the top retracts into this position and it just keeps on going. The top ends up in the, in the compartment. Then the tonneau closes and locks. And then if the bar and the windows were up, the bar and the windows go back up. Okay, that's the whole down sequence. The up sequence, you actuate the switch, bar and windows go down, tonneau unlocks, tonneau opens. Top comes up, note the window latches aren't latched yet on this one. Next, window latches latch, then to no closes and locks, then bow goes down and locks, and then windows come up. Okay, so it's, it's just really important to know that sequence. Okay, I'm gonna come out of screen share here. And let's see. Any questions I should go after yet? Let me see. Um, I'm going to go a few, through a few questions at this pause here. Uh, the first question, Hugh Whipple, he has a 129 and a 207. Both are 10 years old. Are the server cylinders are the same for both cars? I do not know the answer to that question. I do. What's a 207? I don't know what that is. Q, what's a 207? Sorry, uh, the A207 is like the, uh, let's see, 2008 through 15 E-class Cabriolets. So like uh, I have an E550 from 2012. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe Danny does. I had somebody ask me about 171s the other day, and I went over and looked at the DUIs for that, and I found it was just totally different. And that's about the same time frame as the uh, as what you're talking about. So I doubt if it's the same. Um, I know 124 Cabriolets and 129s 
are very, very similar because they use the same technology. 10 years later, I, I would not assume that at all. Thank you. Gary, I'll tell you that even though some of those cylinders may look the same, they may be designed differently on the inside. They'll have a different part number on them. Um, like there was, an, a, there was a changeover made in 96 and 97 um, to the, the, uh, the diameter of some of the shafts, like on the tonneau covered lifts, um, things like that. So they may look similar. I don't know that I would try to interchange them just because of the, op they, may, they, op they may operate differently. Yeah, and what you'll find is if you go to the Top Hydraulics website, they've got DUIs for just about every type of car, not just, not just Mercedes, although the 171 DUI was, you know, wasn't much there. And, and I've got a 208 Cabriolet as well. And when I researched how to do that top, you've actually got to unbolt the top from the car and move it to get the main cylinders out. So though the discipline of the procedure is the same, uh, it's the way that it's put into the car can be very, very different. And so you've got to you know, pay a lot of attention to that for your specific car. And so I wouldn't, you can't generalize too much of this to the other cars, although the general work practices will be the same. So speaking of general work practices, I'm gonna go back to, to the questions in a little bit, but I'd like to try to do questions in, the, in order in the next ones uh, a little bit off topic. So we'll get back to that. So let's talk about general work practices, kind of the basics of the way I approach these. Well, one, I'll point out, small hands do help. You know, large hands may be a little bit of a challenge doing some of these. And I've got very small hands, so that's kind of helpful. Um, I mentioned core exchange earlier. Always do core exchange if possible. That means when you're, you order the rebuilt cylinders and have them on hand when you're doing the job. A couple advantages to that. One, the car is not going to sit for a month waiting for the core exchange or waiting for the uh, rebuilt ones to come back. Two, you'll remember better what you did if you're just going to take a cylinder out and put another cylinder right back in. And, but if you're uncomfortable with removing the cylinders from the locks, you can send the cylinders in with the locks and Top Hydraulics is perfectly happy to take the cylinders out of the locks, rebuild them, and put them back in the locks. Now, there's no really good reason to be uncomfortable removing the cylinders from the locks. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. It's, it's relatively straightforward. Now, a couple of other, you know, basic discipline things have a procedure. You know, take the top hydraulics DUIs and print it out and have it with you and, and go through it and check off the steps as you go through them. Uh, Dean's comment, have a lot of light. And I use a, a little headlight on a strap or attached uh, on my forehead. And I usually have a small LED flashlight as well. Uh, and I usually have a well-lighted space. Uh, it's, you know, you're in, in under things sometimes. It can be hard to see. So the light's really important. I'd also advise you to take a lot of pictures. You often don't even know you know, what you're going to be looking for when you come back to look at the picture. So before you start, take a lot of pictures and then during the process, take pictures that helps you get things in the right place, especially hydraulic lines and electrical cables uh, when you put it back together, especially if you're doing core exchange and you're ending up waiting a month and coming back to it. Now, I always bag and label the parts removed. I use uh, Ziploc bags. Usually I use snack bags. Sometimes I use quart bags, but I label them with a paint pen. I always have a paint pen in my pocket. And I also put them in the order, usually in a box, in the order that I remove the parts. So that way I can go and do the reassembly and just work back through and it helps the uh, assembly sequence. Now, you're working on a hydraulic system. Cleanliness is vital. You cannot afford to have a speck of dirt get in a hydraulic system. And so as soon as you get the hydraulic lines off, you have to make sure that they never come in contact with the dirt. I usually put a, a paper towel over them and make sure they're secure in a place where they can't get dirty. And for those that have position adjustment, uh, which is basically the locks, mark where they are. 
so that when you put them back in, you can put them in in about the same place. And that way you, you can avoid having to do any type of adjustment. Now, one of the things that you end up doing is doing some manual motion moving up the top. And the reason for that, you know, a lot of these you might start out, especially the main cylinders and the bow extend retract cylinders, you know, you, you'll want to start off with the top down. And when you actuate the top and lower it, the roll bar goes down. And so when you work on the main cylinder and the bow extend retract cylinder, you have to have the roll bar up. You cannot remove the interior panels without the roll bar being up. But you can't do that automatically because it'll go down as soon as you try to move the top. And so you put the top down and then you use the switch to raise the bar up, turn off the car, and then when you have to move the top, you move it manually. Now, doing that alone is kind of a challenge because it's, there's a lot of resistance, it's kind of heavy, and you're also working against the hydraulic oil in the cylinders when you're moving it manually. And 129s don't have a pump bypass or anything like that to help you out. What I do when I'm having to do that, you know, tops down, the bars up, and I take my shoes off and I put the seats all the way forward and I stand on the floor in the back facing to the rear, kind of lean on the bar and put my hands on the center of the top and pull it gently, slowly up until I get in the position I need it to be in. Because otherwise you cannot get the bar up in the top in the right position. You can, you know, there is enough room to do this. It's a little tight on the rear window when you're pulling the rear window over it. I recommend putting a terry cloth towel over the bar so you don't scratch the rear window when you're doing this. One other thing that's uh, of course a big potential in this is getting the interior dirty or screwing something up in the interior. And so cleanliness is really important to make sure that you put the car back uh, with the interior looking as good as it did when you started. So what do I do to try to focus on that? Well, one, I usually, when I'm doing this type of work that requires me getting in the car, I usually wear slippers and pull the slippers off and just go into the car with stocking feet. And I usually wear medical scrubs bottoms to do this work because there's no exterior metal on them and nothing there's no forward pocket so there's no way to scratch the car in fact I'm wearing medical scrub bottoms right now I also wash my hands a lot I mean every time you touch the interior you've got to think about how clean your hands are and clean them off so you don't put fingerprints on the carpet that will be very hard to get off and when you change when you pull the hydraulic lines off you're going to get oil on your hands and so you end up washing your hands a lot. And I also often use latex gloves to keep my fingers clean enough. And I'm very sensitive about when I touch an interior part. And I put paper towels on the carpet, uh, especially door sills and the, the rear floor carpet before removing the hydraulic lines for the main cylinders, because you will certainly get oil on the carpet if you don't do that. The, main, the, the bottom hydraulic line for the main cylinder uh, will give you oil on the on the door sill. So be very careful about that. And one other little hint, do not reinstall the interference until you've operationally tested the roof and made sure it actually works. And you could say, ask me how I know, because I, and one reason that I have done a lot of interior removal is that I had a problem and had to pull the interior out after having just put it in. And that's how I also got some experience of which glues work on putting those pieces together. All right, so I'm gonna go back to screen sharing here and I'm gonna show you some pictures. So let me get back over here, screen share, and there we go. There, so you should see that picture of the last one I saw. Ruben, you see in picture? Yep. Okay, all right, so. Look at the type of clips that you have that you have to deal with. Some of the clips are E-clips. And there's a little picture of an E-clip. This goes in a slot on the end of a pin. 
And there's also another type of clip here. This is on a main cylinder. And this type of clip has a, a little lock on it. And you take a little screwdriver and you push the lock out so it's not on the pin anymore. And then you just slide the pin out. And these are significantly easier than the Eclipse to deal with because they're just larger. Okay, the other thing, you have to keep track of the wire and the hose routing. Now, I want to point out that all the hoses and most of the cylinders have numbers on them to make sure that you put them back in the right place. Let's see this picture of this. This is a, I believe, a bow extension cylinder. Notice it's got numbers on it. Now, not all the cylinders have numbers on them. Any of the cylinders that are the same from the right side to the left side of the car will not have numbers. The ones that are different left to right have numbers on them. And so uh, you could screw this up and put these hydraulics lines in the wrong place on these cylinders that have the line, the ports located close together. So pay attention to that. You know, just wanted to show, this is one way that you see numbers. This is a main cylinder and see there's numbers on the line here. Now, in a main cylinder, you're, you're never going to get the hydraulic lines screwed up because the ports are so far apart. But on that previous one, you see they're very close together. It would be physically possible to put them in the wrong port. The other thing that you need to pay attention to is how the hoses got routed. It is physically possible in some of these to put the hoses on the wrong side of a bracket when you're reinstalling it. So look carefully, take a picture and make sure they go back in both the wires and the hoses in the same place that they came out of. Okay. It's always useful to have a couple of the biggest sets of paper towel rolls that you can buy uh, on hand because often you have to prop the roof in a kind of a weird position and these big rolls of paper towels and of course toilet paper will work too. Uh, it's, it's very handy to have these around for propping the uh, top in, in unusual positions. And the other thing I like about paper towels, you know, I will say you cannot afford to drop these E clips or those other clips or the hydraulic line clips because you probably aren't going to have any more of them around. And if you drop it inside the structure of the car, you may never get it back. And so you got to be very careful when you are removing them. And one thing I do is I stuff the area that they could fall into with paper towels to try to make it easier to retrieve if I happen to drop it. Now, of course, you've got to absolutely make sure that you remove all these paper towels before you move the top again either. Hey, Gary, this is Dean. Hey, Dean. Hey, um, on those clips, on the hydraulic clips, if, uh, if you ask real nicely, um, Top Hydraulics will give you a couple extra ones for free. Yeah, um, they've, been, they've been sending extra Eclipse, too, these days, too. So it's kind of ha handy to have that. I've got a couple of e extra Eclipse, too. But yeah, you, you certainly... It's useful to have extra ones, but you really should make sure you don't drop them. Yeah, no, for sure. And this other, this picture is the way I usually remove the Eclipse and the wavy washers and things like that and the pins with a very, very big magnet and usually a hook tool to remove the Eclipse or sometimes a screwdriver. And most of the time, you know, there are basically three things that happen when you remove an e-clip. It just comes out and it's in your hand. That's nice. It comes out and it, it hooks on the magnet, which is nice. Or it comes out and then goes bing and, and goes all over the place. And that's not so nice. And I try to avoid that. One other way to avoid that is kind of put a rag over what you're doing, but it makes it a little hard to see. But removing it, of course, I had to take this picture with one hand, so I, I could and hold the magnet with the other hand, so I couldn't show you the, the little hook tool that I was using to get this out. And this one, I'm actually removing the wavy washer that's in there, but it's the same same idea. You don't want to, to lose any of these pieces. Okay, let me see. I'm gonna come out of screen share for a minute. And I just wanted to, to show you some of the things that I have on my desk to, to use on, under the, make sure you have the right 
tools. One is I really like inspection magnets. I say, excuse me, inspection mirrors. I have a lot of inspection mirrors. And I say this because nowadays, whenever I am removing one of these, uh, fasteners, I'm going to try to take a look at it first and see what it is. The first one of these hydraulic cylinders I did was the left bow extension cylinder on a 124 cabriolet. And that's way down in the car and you can't see it easily. And I got confused with the instructions and I used a 12 point uh, socket on it and it's actually a five millimeter Allen. And somehow I was able to get it out without screwing it up. But it scared me because I'm not sure what you'd do if you actually stripped off one of those heads. You'd, you'd, I don't think you'd ever get it out. And so nowadays, part of the, the discipline is to go look at every one of these before you try to take it off. And I found this inspection mirror is really useful. Let me come out of, let me turn off my virtual background because I know my stuff kind of disappears here. And let me do that for a sec. Choose virtual background, none. Okay, so this stuff's a little easier to see now. This is my favorite inspection mirror. I've got a lot of them, but this is a good one to get in beside a bolt and use a flashlight and so you can actually see what it is and verify that you're using the right tool for the job because you, you just cannot afford to screw up uh, the head of one of these in an inaccessible location. And a few others. A little tools I like. Let me get so I can see. All right. My screen's going away. All right, anyway, so a few other tools you'll need trim removal tools. This is usually a set of five or so tools that you can get at, like at O'Reilly's or something like that. These are the two I use the most. Uh, you will certainly use these during doing this job. Also, when you have to pull off door cards, you'll need these. I tend to use a hook tool. This is one of my favorite, uh, just a little hook tool to pull the uh, Eclipse off. And as Dean said about having spares, these are spare Eclipse and these were actually sent to me by Top Hydraulics. They're kind of doing that nowadays. This is a piece of the sprayer that comes on carburetor cleaners and stuff like that. I always save these. When you see in the instructions, he talks about the match trick for doing the bow extension cylinders. Well, I never had matches around, but I always had these around. So I use these for that uh, match trick to keep the bottom of the cylinder in place when you're moving the top. The other thing I found handy I didn't know these existed until I just kind of stumbled across them. These are articulated pliers. And so they, they allow you to reach a long ways into a place. And I've got one that's crook turned and I've got one that's straight here. And I find these are very useful for sometimes hydraulic clips that you can't get to very well. Sometimes the hydraulic lines you can't get to very well. And um, I always end up using this one for the main cylinder to once you disconnect the rod on the main cylinder to retract it all the way. And when I'm installing the main cylinder to reach in and pull it back up to put it into the bracket. So these are really neat tools, huh? I, got, I think I got these on Amazon or something. All right. So let's, oh, by the way, you also need a T30 Torx for the windshield, uh, windshield locks. And if you're gonna work on any of the newer cars, you might as well just get a Torx set and eat and an e-torque set, because you're gonna need them. The newer the car is, the more you need them. Okay, back to screen share. And let me go back to there. Now, I'll go back to this picture. And I'll mention that you can still lose them with all, with all of your preparations to not let them fall. This is, in this vise, off to the left side is the one of the bow lock cylinders. And I was in my workshop taking out- Gary, your thing. picture didn't come up. No picture, okay. Thank you. Let me go back to screen share. That's when liability is a zoom. You can't tell whether you're really sharing or not. 
Got it? Okay. Yep. Yeah. I was pulling off the bottom end of the hydraulic cylinder, which is another E-clip with a pin on it. And I had the magnet beside it. And despite that, it goes ping, hits my shoulder, and then I don't see where it goes. And so, and this is an awful place to try to retrieve one of those because I've got metal filings on the floor and all that. So I, I start cleaning up, I get a magnet and uh, I get really frustrated. I stand up, say, what am I going to do now? And there was the, the clip sitting on the vise. I guess the vise is a little magnetic or something. It was kind of handy. But um, you really don't want to lose these. And at the time, I didn't have any spares. But there it was sitting, staring me in the face. Okay, one of my got the basic pieces of guidance is use lots of dental floss. And when I'm putting these back on, I use dental floss and I tie them around the clips. Because uh, when you're putting one of these E-clips on, you're guaranteed it'll take you about three times to do it. And two of those times it'll either fly off or drop. And so I tie dental floss to it. And until it's, you know, I don't remove the dental floss until it's fully in place. Here's another picture. And this is a bow extension cylinder and you can see three pieces of dental floss here before I've cut them off. There's a piece of dental floss around the locating pin. There's a piece of dental floss around the wavy washer and there's a piece of dental floss around the e-clip. And when I get it in satisfactorily, I just take a sharp exacto knife and cut through the through the knots and just pull the dental floss out. You certainly don't want to leave the dental floss in. I like dental floss because it's very strong, it's very small, and it's easy to tie knots with. Now, the other comment I'll have is pay attention to the orientation of these hydraulic clips. This is another thing that's good to take pictures of, and I've got a clearer picture here on the next one. This is another bow extension cylinder. You see how close the head of the clip is to the bracket here? If it was put in this way, there wouldn't be any clearance at all. Some of these um, mounting lugs for these hydraulic lines are offset to one side or the other and you've got to be very diligent about ensuring these clips go back the same way they came off or you very well could end up not having enough room for them. Okay and hey Gary yeah good Danny here I want to if I if I could take a moment to interrupt uh, last night knowing that we may get into a conversation about these clips and losing them and things like that. I actually brought a latch home. I... Danny, you just dropped. <laughs> okay. can, I hit the wrong button, I guess. So can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back up. Am I back yet? So anyway, doing multiples of these things, I'm actually not in my workshop. I'm in a, a place that I don't do automotive repairs, but it's the only place I had a vice. So if I can switch my camera around, you're talking about the clearances being so tight on some of these where you can't get these pins out after you remove this. Yeah. So over the years, I've developed this little tool here. Let's see if I can get a background where it's a screwdriver that I've made. I put a notch in it that holds the clip mm -hmm. and it's magnetized too. So when we go, you don't have to actually remove the whole lock assembly. You can just use the clip tool to reach in there and push it out. I'm not very good at this camera thing. So but anyway, I thought it would be neat for people to see if you wanted to develop something that worked really well. I just this idea that I came up with and I'm quite a few people I can't get my background here where you can see it. But anyway, that thing holds the clip in there. And then once you, install it you push it in how did you, you build that screwdriver back off in your clips how did well, you make it's that? a dremel it's mm -hmm. just a screwdriver regular screwdriver and then if i can get this hang on so you, cut a, light come on. so you cut a little notch in it then and okay that, is that helpful right there yeah on this magnifying glass yeah i want I one cut a little notch in it <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think I could probably patent this for people that do a lot of these jobs. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Anyway. Yeah, I looked 
there is a specific eclip tool that uh, i have not bought because it didn't look like it was any more helpful than than using a you know using the the clips that i've been using yeah the flyaway is what we worry the most about and that kind of prevents some of that too when uh, that happens so anyway okay. i thought it'd be neat to show somebody that good okay was everybody able to see that yes i hope good gary i stopped your screen share so that we could see danny okay good i was wondering why that works so well thank you for doing that okay let me go back to screen share then okay so back to these hydraulic clips this is a picture i just took this one to show you what the hydraulic clips line clips look like this is not one of the cylinders you'll be changing this is a a roll bar uh, cylinder and you don't typically have any issues with those but i just wanted to show you the clip and uh, the i comment look closely at the clips before you remove them because you need to know when you've got them all the way back in and when you're putting them back in when top hydraulics sends you this back these the seals are a little tighter than they were so they can be a little difficult to get in i did this drawing to, to make a point here you've got to make sure when you're putting these back in that you line them up properly nice and straight i usually hold back up in here often with a, a pair of pliers you need to be kind of gentle because you can't afford to crush the line but you hold them you make sure they're straight you wiggle them uh, sometimes it seems like it takes a lot of force and then you look, this wider area here has got to go down below the level of the block or you'll never get the clip in. So you're not all the way in if this isn't level. Once it's down below that level, then you push the clip in. It's also useful to already have the clip started in its grooves, but make sure that it's not in the way of inserting the hydraulic line. But, uh, and it takes a lot of light and you've got to, sometimes it takes a mirror to do it, but make sure it's all the way in before you try to put the clip in. You'll never get this clip on if this isn't all the way in. Okay. And the other piece I wanted to mention here is that some of these clips have wavy washers in them. See this wavy washer? This is another bow extension cylinder and there's a wavy washer in here. Now that wavy washer in itself can be kind of a challenge to put in because you've got to halfway insert the pin and then put the wavy washer in, then put the pin the rest of the way in. But the other problem that often gives you is the wavy washer spreads the bracket a little bit. And then sometimes you can't even see the slot that the eclip goes in. And if you can't see the slot the eclip goes in, you'll never get the eclip in. And what I typically will do is use a a, a small pair of vice grips, and this is actually a larger pair of vice grips. I've got a lot of pairs of vice grips, but so I've padded it here so it's not going to scratch anything. And I'm pushing on the rod, and it's padded over here, and it's pushing it in. And you don't want to really get these really, really tight, just enough to press the wavy washer so that you can see the slot. And then it's relatively easy to get the e clip in, especially if you've got any special tool. Like I say, if you can't see this, the slot, you'll never get it in. Always be careful not to scratch the cylinder at all, too. So I'm, not, I'm on the end of it. I'm not on the cylinder rod here. Hey, Gary, on that. So that's the bow extension cylinder, it looks like. That's a, uh, that is or, a uh, to know lift cylinder. Oh, to know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. But anyway, on, uh, so mine's a 97, right? So, it doesn't have, it didn't have the wavy washer. It had like a, uh, almost a rubberized type washer, real, very thin. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, it, it wasn't an issue, but you could, it'd be easy not to even see that when you were pulling that pin out and stuff. It was almost a uh, translucent color. Yep. And um, so it wasn't a metal piece, but uh, be yeah, easy to miss it. Yeah, those are certainly uh, easier to deal with, but yeah, you have, you've got to look very carefully when you're doing these and make sure that you don't inadvertently just drop something in the car as you're taking them apart. 
because you very well may never get them back if you drop it in the car. And we'll talk a little bit about dropping stuff in the car because I've done that. Now, one other thing you need to do, you never want to put a scratch on, on the piston rod on these. And so in any time you're disconnecting them, the first thing you do, and you see that in the top hydraulics guidance, is you fully compress, you know, push the rod all the way back into the cylinder so you don't have exposed rods, so you don't inadvertently scratch it. Okay, let's talk about the real, um, and I just put this picture in but to show compressing it all the way. Let's talk about the hard part. The hard part in this is not really the cylinder changing. The hard part, in my opinion, is getting the interference out. And to do the bow extension cylinders and to do the main cylinders, you've got to pull the interior components, these, these two big interior panels. And yeah, you can actually do it pretty quickly once you've done it a few times, but there's a, a liability to it too. And I'll show you what that liability is. Uh, I will also point out that uh, in addition to what the top hydraulics guidance says to do, I also remove these storage compartment covers. And I put in this picture to show you why. See, the storage compartment cover goes right down in here. This, this uh, ridge here is from where the storage compartment cover normally sits. And with those off, you can get your hands under here and lift upward pretty easily. If you leave them on, you have to open them and they'll be sitting up here and they'll be pinning the thing in, uh, which Get, takes away some of the flexibility, you probably need to get these off. Now, when you take those storage compartment covers off, you know, which you'll, they, they screw in through these brackets here. One of the things to remember is that when you take the subwoofer out, the gravity is going to make these brackets sit down and it's pretty easy to put the subwoofer back in with the brackets in the wrong position and you can't put the storage compartment cover on. So then you've got to take the subwoofer out again and raise these up, maybe tape them up so that you can actually install the storage compartment cover. You know, ask me how I know that because I've certainly screwed that up. But the real liability to this is that when you pull this interior panel off, and this is the right side, the back of the right side one, and there's one clip on it that stayed on. And I think this is probably the original uh, adhesive the factory used. There's also supposed to be a clip here. There's supposed to be a clip here. And there's two kind of hanger clips up here. They're all off of it. And every one of these I've ever done, at least one of the clips, and in most cases, all the clips come off. And then you've got to put them back on. And this is something that I would recommend you do as soon as you take it off, because there's a, I'll use a glue and I usually want to wait 24 hours for the glue to dry before putting these back on. So the first thing I'll do, I do when I pull these off is, is prepare to put them back together again. Here's what these clips look like. These are the two of the other that broke off. You saw one in the previous picture, it looked like that. These plastic pins, heads go into this, and these are the hooks that go on the top that, that hook in kind of under where the roll bar goes. If you had this, let me go back to the previous picture. If you put these in the right orientation, so the opening sits down, then when you're removing this panel, you, you have to pop this one out. There's, and then you can basically lift up these two will disengage from the pin. The pin will stay on the panel and you just go up and these come out of their slots. And you have to do a little manipulation to get this piece around where it's uh, uh, around the body pieces. You don't even have to try to pry these out because that's kind of handy. I've done it both ways and that's by far the easiest way as long as these were installed correctly. And of course, when you put them back on, you put the opening to the bottom. Okay, so how do you put them back on? I've tried several different glues. I've tried JB Weld, you know, like 60 second epoxy, uh, JB Weld, uh, five minute epoxy. I've tried JB Weld for plastics. None of them work. They fell off just pretty much immediately. The things I've found that work are, is this white stuff is Gorilla Glue, uh, Gorilla Tape. 
and I think it would probably hold it on without anything else. The other thing I've done here is I've used Gorilla Glue or a like product and clamped it for 24 hours. You see, I've got a piece of wood here to protect the carpet on the other side of it. If you're using a Gorilla Glue product, it expands when it dries. And so you've got to take an X-Acto knife and cut it away, cut the expanded part away so you still have access to this slot in here. But the combination of the Gorilla Tape and that type of glue I found pretty much holds them on when pretty much nothing else will. Now, the other thing that I will point out too, not in this picture though, when you're taking off the trunk interior to do the rear, the tonneau lift and the bow lock cylinders, you have to be very careful about where it interfaces with the rear fuse box because it'll break the tabs off that hold the fuse box cover. So you've got to be, you know, pull it down before you go across that or you'll break those off. You know, ask me how I know that one. And this one, I put this slide in because I found that when you're doing on certain of the cars, and this is a, I think this is a 2001, certain of the cars, there's not really enough access to get a socket and a ratchet on the main cylinder bolt. This is the right side of the car uh, in the storage compartment with the bottom of the storage compartment removed. This is the top controller right here. The bolt for the main cylinder is back under here. And so you have to lift these electrical cables to get to it. And you basically pull the, open up the covers on the uh, conduit tray here for electrical cables to lift the cables. But I found I didn't have a, enough room in here to get the socket on. And so I removed this connector from the top module. My recommendation to you is if you're gonna remove this connector, disconnect the battery first. And I did that because but the time that I didn't do it, when I was refitting this connector, I could hear it kind of making and breaking the electrical contact. And I'm sure that wasn't good for the top controller. And then I had a little difficulty getting the top to respond properly. And I think the controller was a little confused. And so I just disconnect the battery if I'm gonna unplug this one now. Okay. Now I wanna comment on some differences between the years of the car. That is a bow lock cylinder from a 94 and earlier. That's a bow lock cylinder for a, early, a newer than 94. Notice it doesn't have the extension out here to latch it down. The er, newer ones are easier to get out. And oh, by the way, let me go back to this for a second. You really can lock down the bow on a newer car. There's no holes in the trunk liner to get your tool in, but if you take the trunk liner out, you can put a crescent wrench on these and actually lock the bow down, even though the owner's manual says you can. Now, the other piece of this, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a second. Okay, let me, and let me turn on my virtual background. There. Okay. All right, the other piece though, Match trick, uh, I mentioned that using that little piece of, the little red piece for the uh, match tick trick. And the uh, reason that you have to do this on the later cars, 94 and earlier, the bow extension cylinder has a five millimeter bolt and it's really pretty straightforward. You put the bolt in, you screw it in, you're done. The newer cars use a, an E-clip with a pin on it. And you, you can't both get the pin in and get the E-clip on, so you have to move the top. And you have to move the top with the bottom of the cylinder not yet uh, put uh, fixed in place. And that's why the match trick stick is match stick trick is important and I use this for it. You put this in to hold the cylinder in and then you move the top so that this lines up with the access hole and then you pull this piece out and put the pin in and then you move the top again to put the e-clip on. It's, it's significantly easier on the older cars. 
Okay, a few other things to talk about. I'm going to go back to screen share. And here, and here. Okay, I think I'm screen sharing. Okay, for the left side main cylinder, you have to remove the subwoofer. It's big. It's this big plastic thing here. There's three 10 millimeter headed bolts here, here, and here, and two electrical connectors to get to the bolt head, which is down here. However, this thing also seems to be bonded to the floor of the car. If it's never been out before, it can be very difficult. The first one of these I did, imagine me sitting here with a six foot long crowbar getting this thing out. And it's a plastic part. And so I'm always worried about breaking it. But you, you basically gently pry and increase the pressure and you start getting it to move and then you move around and, you, and it finally moves and you finally break it away. But that's one of the things I'm always a little worried about and why I don't really like to do left side main cylinders. It's just getting the subwoofer out. I've never broken one. Some come out e easier than others. And this is what it looks like with it out. With it out here, the main cylinder head bolt head is down behind this piece of carpet. And you can also see the hole that allows you access to the bottom of the bow extension cylinder up here. All right, let's talk about removing cylinders from the locks. Okay, this is an example of a lock. This is the windshield lock. You see that the rod is screwed into a part of the bracket. And so you've got to disconnect this. And your first question is, well, how can I get in there? Well, you don't have to get in there because you unbolt these bolts and it's similar for the other locks. You take off the other end of the cylinder and you can rotate it out. So you get perfect access to this, but there's this little flat in here and it's not very wide. And it either requires a seven millimeter or a five millimeter depending uh, wrench, depending on which of the cylinders you're doing. And it has to be a very thin wrench. And the top hydraulics will loan you one, looks like that, to, to use in here. I've actually made one. I just took a seven millimeter one and filed it down so it was thin enough to get in here. But your other issue is that these are put on with red Loctite. And red Loctite does not release unless you do something special. And uh, the something special, and the best one, is to heat it. Before I bought a heat gun, I used to use a hairdryer. And I, I kept it hot for about 30 minutes, and then I had no trouble getting them off. I think that was getting to about 230, 225 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that I've got a heat gun, I've gone as short as about 10 minutes with a heat gun, gotten it to about 360 degrees. You've got to do it long enough that it gets the, temp, the metal all the way inside heated up. And when you're using a heat gun, you've also got to be very careful that you don't melt anything else. I mean, you could, you could melt electrical wires or something like that with it. So, you know, watch where your air is blowing, but don't be afraid of doing this. You know, just get it up to the right amount of heat, let it be hot long enough that it soaks all the way through. And then a little seven millimeter wrench will allow you to get this undone. Okay. And uh, let's talk about some of the things I've screwed up. I'll come out of screen share here. Okay. Now, hydraulic hose routing, I've mentioned. Uh, the bow extension cylinder hoses, you can easily put them in the wrong place, like under the wrong bracket. So, you know, the, just take pictures, maybe do drawings, uh, label, tape them in the right place. But uh, watch the hydraulic hose and watch the electrical cable routing. Now, Another thing you can do, you can crack the rear window if it's really cold because you've got to operate the top and to operate the top, the rear window folds. I did one of these where it was about 32 degrees outside. The car was in a garage. We uh, provided heating to the garage, but it really didn't get warm enough. And we actually put a little crack in the rear window as we were operating it. So you know, my guidance to you would be try not to do it when it's cold. If you have to do it when it's cold, apply heat to the rear window so it's warm enough so that it's, the plastic's pliable enough. The fix for that, by the way, if you don't want to like spend the money to replace the top, there is a, a, uh, 
a, a tape that's available on Amazon for not very much money that's uh, specifically for cracks in convertible top rear windows that I always keep around. Now, I mentioned the micro switch on the, the uh, bow extension cylinder. The, I've actually broken that micro switch. The directions in the DUI tell you to be very careful about that. And the first couple of times I did it, I didn't have any problems with it. And then I got resourceful and decided to hook it up a little differently. And what I did differently, when you're doing the bow extension cylinder on the left side, the one that has the micro switch on it, you know, you'll, you'll disconnect the both ends of the cylinder, and then you'll move it up a little bit. And you'll pull the hydraulic line clips off, and then you pull the clips off, and then you can take the cylinder out. The lines are long enough that you can actually hook them back up with the cylinder off the car, you know, just a little bit above its normal mounting location. And that's how I did it the last time I did it. The problem is if you do it that way with the micro switch on it, you really can't fit it back in the car. You have to put it kind of in its location and then put the hydraulic lines on and put the hydraulic line clips on. And that's a little bit difficult in itself. And what I did is I ended up breaking that uh, micro switch in trying to do it that way. Now, what I always do is I put it on with the micro switch uh, not installed yet. And that way you have plenty of room to be able to have good access to the hydraulic cylinders and get the cylinder in place. But then you have to put the micro switch on once the car is back together. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's not as straightforward as you might think. Let me go back and screen share here for a second. It's not as straightforward as you might think because you don't quite have perfect access to the screw holes. You can't get straight in on the bottom one because the bracket for the main cylinder gets in the way. And so the way I decided to approach that was to take something that should look pretty familiar to you. This is the hose that's used on the, the wiper on the uh, windshield washer. The screw fits perfectly into this thing and then you can use it to start the screws. I, I started these two. You can actually get straight into those two. The bottom one you can't get straight into, but you can curve the hose, start it, and you, you can actually run it up pretty far and then get a, a Phillips screwdriver on it and tighten it the rest of the way. But uh, I was always worried about trying to do this and dropping these screws, but now this is the way I do it. And you see how I added everything to try to not lose a screw if I drop it. But this works on works pretty well. Hey Gary, on a side note on that, that one cylinder that you're talking about, and then you may already be getting to this and I may be jumping the gun, but it's very important, the orientation of that top of that cylinder, the head of it, because it's the hole's not in the center, and if you get it turned side or 180 out, it won't contact the micro switch, and that's kind of frustrating once you get it all back together to realize that the, the actual shaft is turned 180 degrees. You can see it in your picture there. Yeah, that's that the next holes. picture, and you can see these are the two cylinders. This is the right side. This is the left side, and you see how. This is different between the two cylinders, and this can be installed, as Danny said, the wrong way. And the micro switch will never make, and the top will not operate past bow up. And so, yeah, that's it. That, that is one of the things you can screw up doing this. All right. Okay, here's the other real screw up I did. And uh, if you look at this, this is the main cylinder. The main cylinder, the bottom is held in by this bolt. And the bolt's head is way back here. I would mentioned accessing it in one of the previous slides. Now, if you're doing this core exchange, you'll just take the main cylinder out, put the next main cylinder in, you'll be fine. And I had done that for all the ones I'd done in the past. Recently, I had an issue where I couldn't get a core exchange main cylinder, so I had to send it off for rebuild. And when I did it, I was pulling both of them off. So I took my little 14 millimeter socket off of the bolt after I got it off and it goes kaboom into the car. And that 
the boat will fall into a void inside the car that is inaccessible. Now, I'd never done that before, and I was actually working on somebody else's car, and they were there with me. I was amazed that I didn't use any really explicatives when I, when I dropped the thing, but I was, you know, thinking about it, it was a major disaster, and I ran off and bought, bought every magnetic tool over at O'Reilly's, and I borrowed a boroscope, which was actually totally unhelpful in getting the thing out, but uh, let me explain what, what happens with this thing. The bolt head's right about here, and I didn't understand this to the point where actually once I got it out in putting it in I dropped it again <laughs> which was a little embarrassing but before because I had worked I had to get it out I got it out the second time in about 10 minutes so here's what happens that I did not realize when you're trying to insert this bolt in to the main cylinder and this is where it goes into the main cylinder right here and the threads are here and you're supported right here where it goes into the car. And so imagine the center of gravity versus the center of support on this thing. As you're inserting this in, if you don't have something out here, like you know, taping on the 14 millimeter socket with an extension, if you don't have something out here and you're just using your hand, by the time you got it here and before it's in the main cylinder, the center of gravity is way out here and it falls in the hole. And so the way to do this is to tape the main tape the socket onto it to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if you have to do this, uh, say core exchange, use a separate 14 millimeter socket for the other side and tape that one on, just never take them off and you won't lose these. Okay, how do you get them out if you drop them in? None of the magnetic retrieval tools I had helped. However, a long piece of electrical wire that you can bend into a shape and that it will hold with a little piece of a magnet retrieval tool on the end, especially one that has a shield around it so it won't latch on things to the side. It's very helpful. I, I still have this tool. But all you do is feed it in, bend it so it gets to the bottom of the void, and you'll pick up the bolt. You pick it up. Of course, you get to it and you're sideways to the hole. Now what do you do? Well, you have a second magnetic retrieval tool that's got a small head on it you feed it through the hole put it beside the other one pull this one off and then walk it up to your basically repeat that until you're at the head and then you just pull it out and it's actually really easy and like I said the second time I did it it only took 10 minutes and so I don't fear this anymore but then I also taped the socket to it and I don't drop them anymore either so that's the things I have screwed up in this. Let me come out of screen share here and do a little conclusion. The, uh, when you've got it all put it back together, you still got to get the top to work afterwards. So remember that when you worked on those latches, the latches have to be fully open on, after you install them because well, they've got to be open to, to make the top work. Sometimes the car just, the top just works. Other times you have to put the top in a known position, which means manually put it either fully up or fully down. And usually the top will start functioning from that point. It seems to me that the top controller sometimes gets confused about what position the top is in and, and it takes care of the confusion when you put it into a known position. If you've disconnected the battery on the, newer cars, you're going to have to reset the window up feature because the uh, window the top controller won't know where the windows are. And that's just done by pressing in the up direction for uh, two to three seconds after the window's all the way up and it resets the knowledge of where the window is. Now, there will be air in the hydraulic lines. And so it'll take a little bit sometimes to get the air out. It may take longer than you expect, You've got to make sure that you in that you don't run out of fluid in the hydraulic reservoir. You know, watch that closely when you're doing this and top it up as many times as you need to. Also, I'd recommend making sure the battery is fully charged. Uh, maybe run the engine to make sure you have enough electrical power because you don't want a dead battery or a low battery to confuse you about why well, the top won't operate. Also, as I said before, operate the top 
and check for leaks before you install the reinstall the interference. I had one of these where I installed a main cylinder that I was actually leaking worse in the cylinder I took off. And it, it stalled the top and I needed to be able to see where the oil was coming from. It also allows you to get to the, the micro switches, especially the left side bow extension micro switch. Nowadays, I usually take an ohm meter and verify that micro switch is actually working because if it doesn't provide the right signal, the top will stall with the bow up and it won't open the to know. The, uh, but basically, if, the, if, the, if it lifts the bow and stops, then it's probably the micro switch. And of course, top up the reservoir when you're done to make sure that uh, you're not gonna run around with too little in the reservoir. You do not want to run that reservoir dry because you don't want to burn up your pump. That's significantly more expensive than these uh, hydraulic cylinders. So in conclusion, and, and we'll address your questions here. Uh, my point is that this is not a particularly difficult job. There are a few things you can screw up, but paying attention and you know hearing what I've screwed up, you probably won't screw up. It does require patience, it requires discipline, it requires attention to detail, it sort of requires small hands, but it's certainly something you can do. And I certainly recommend you do this yourself instead of taking it to, to folks. But uh, in any case, I'm uh, glad to answer your questions. Thank you for uh, listening to me for a little bit longer than I was expecting to go. So let me get back to the picture here. Okay. So what questions do we have? Ruben, could you go ahead and just ask them to me in, in order? I've kind of lost track of where we are in the chat window. Definitely. I'm just going to go, um, I'm going to start with all the questions in the chat. There's not that many. Um, maybe a couple more will come in. So Hugh Whipple says, hi, folks, have an R129 or an A2. Oh, we went over that one, right? Yeah, yeah, we did that. Um, okay. Richard Lishik, good morning all, bought a 17,000 mile R129 in excellent shape, climate controlled and barely used. I have no issues with the hydraulics, but want to know how to lube the parts if they can be kept functioning. The sounds are intimidating too, so all I am concerned about is to keep it still functioning as is. So pretty much um, preventative maintenance question. I wonder what, uh, Richard, what sounds are you talking about? I mean, the, the window lock cylinders are quite loud, when they unlatch. So don't let that bother you. That's normal. No, I, I understand. Um, it's just that it's a symphony of locks and clicks and bangs. I just want to be sure that um, I'm very pleased that everything is working. I just want to be sure that if there's anything I can lubricate since it's all working functionally, um, is there anything I can maintenance wise? Danny, you got anything to add with that? I mean, I just, I like to operate the top periodically just to make sure it works. And I like to operate, uh, like uh, George Murphy says on the climate control system, every time you get in the car, operate the defrost to make sure that the AC compressor gets activated. Danny, anything else to add there? It's a good point though that you make. To, to operate the top is what it's designed to do. We'll keep all the stills lubricated and it keeps, you know, everything functioning the way it's supposed to we when we do services on those cars we will use a clear uh, lubricant you know i don't you don't need to there's no specific one but also to know that you don't want to over lubricate anything either because it just makes uh the particular latch or whatever you're lubricating just attract more dirt and you know stuff that could stay in there so it there is a maintenance on those cars that came, you know, when we started A and B services or minor or A or uh, easy services on them. It was to lubricate the latches you could get to. And we just simply sprayed a clear lubricant on it. Uh, just a couple little drops just to keep them functioning correctly. But yet, uh, I, I know there was a question that's asked and we may be getting to it. Some There was somebody had said something about maybe I just shouldn't use my top at all. I disagree with that. I think it should be used a lot, you know, and to keep things functioning right. If you don't use it, you lose it. Got it. Good, perfect, thank you. Yeah, that's certainly a case on, on Mercedes. You really want to operate the car. They do not like to just sit. Correct. All right, um, we have a question from Charlie. 
no last name, um, got an R129 1999 living in New York. What do you guys do storing cars for the winter, soft top up or down? So storage question. You always store a convertible with the top up fully latched uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the top will actually shrink when it's down in the, in the well. I had one of those where the hard top had been on forever. Uh, it was a 107 and I almost couldn't get the top on. I had to wet the top and sit it out in the sun so it would stretch enough that I could get the top on. Uh, and you really don't want the window to set, stay folded for a long period of time either. So you always store a convertible with the top up fully latched. All right. Um, question from Victor Hess. Is there supposed to be a longer sequence, a sorry, longer pause between any of the sequences or one fluid operation? Well, I mean, <laughs> fluid is, yeah, there's fluid going, but it's not the most fluid operation. I mean, you, you activate on dropping the top, you activate it, you see the windows go down, you, you know, you see the bow come up, you see the tonneau come up, you hear the really loud unlatch of the windshield window latches. Then you have the main cylinder operate and the main cylinder has a lot more um, motion it's got to go through. So that part of it takes longer and takes a lot more hydraulic fluid as well. That gets down and then you see the uh, tonneau come down you hear that latch and you're done. And then the wow. windows come up, the but the, ma the main cylinder takes longer. Okay. Nice seat. Sorry. The main cylinder was a slow one, so that you answered my question. There's a little bit. Of, it takes longer to do that heavier yeah. operation. Yeah, the main you... cylinder is physically much longer and larger than the rest of the cylinder, so it takes a lot more hydraulic oil. And the the hydraulic pump is just a a you know positive displacement pump. It doesn't change its speed when it's doing that, so that takes longer. All right, we have a question from Liz Deminsky. Pantosin or MBZHM hydraulic oil for a system fluid change? So I think they mean a fluid flush. Uh, ZMH is the uh, fluid. It's, uh, and I don't think that's the same as the Pantosin CH12F. Danny, do you know that? I mean, I use either Mercedes-Benz uh, branded fluid or ZHM, which is the Mercedes-Benz branded fluid. We use the Mercedes Benz fluid. There is some contest as to whether or not the Pentosin, the 11S, is a usable fluid in there. It's a different color. We don't, we, we wouldn't, we always would use the factory fluid. It just makes sense, especially with the new seals that are going in it. And top hydraulics will probably be the, the, the god when it comes to this because it's actually their Nippon seals that were being used. So, they may be real particular about what they want in their cylinders. Yeah, I normally go to the Mercedes dealer and buy the uh, ZHM fluid, which is the hydraulic fluid for the top. And I'll, I'll point out that Pentosin, the CH11F, I think it is, the Pentosin fluid, that, that's a power steering fluid. And Mercedes uh, stocks a different fluid for the power steering. And I buy both of those. I've noticed on my Porsche 996, it has its spec for that Pentosin uh, power steering fluid. So I suspect that's probably what the Mercedes power steering fluid is, but it's not the same fluid for the top. All right. Um, we have a follow up to um, that question. How often, if at all, does the system need to be bled, let alone change the hydraulic, the hydraulic fluid? I should probably let Danny answer that one because i never do that i mean the uh and there are people never, that tell you that you're supposed to go ahead danny there wasn't there's not a service interval on the hydraulic fluid itself um it, it always gets checked as your spare tire gets checked to make sure that the level's there you're going to know that the 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 level's low before you even recognize it in the pump anyway but there is no service interval on the actual exchange of the fluid. Uh, I, I know that like we, when we talk about brake fluid exchange and stuff like that, it's because it's hygroscopic and it can absorb moisture. I don't know that we have that issue uh, on this hydraulic system. And there is a small filter in there to 
uh, inside the pump assembly um, that could be a serviceable item if you felt like there was a reason why you had to clean any of that out. But I don't know that this necessarily, the fluid's a, uh, a, a phenomenal fluid. It doesn't, I don't know that we're going to cause any issues by not doing a service on them. I don't know that it would help is yeah. the answer. Yeah, that's kind of kind of the way I look at it as well. Right. Okay. What else? Um, a question from Dave. I'm experiencing a hum from the control module that only occurs when the engine is running. Doesn't happen when the key is in position too. Any thoughts? Are you sure it's from the the top control module? Yeah, I've, I've narrowed it down as best I can. Um, I don't think that it has anything to do with any of the pumps or anything like that. No noise from that. It's very evident though when you take the when you know when you access that and lift get everything out of there like the picture you showed with uh where that one bolt was on the right hand side of the car there's definitely a hum coming from there how long does it last it's the whole to any time the car is running this is top the top operate fine. Fine. the top operate seems to operate fine yeah like danny is mentioning fuel pump yeah now your fuel I, pump is mounted right underneath there okay that now it's loud enough for i mean it's it's definitely audible should i be thinking about the possibility of a new uh, fuel pump um either that or seems to run fine if the fuel filter got changed on it and the lines got tweaked a little bit it's mounted on rubber dampeners to keep that noise out of the car okay. so maybe the plastic shield that's around it is is displaced or something similar to that but i would i would do more i would guess that it's definitely your fuel pump not that module there's not anything in there that could make a humming noise right there's no big uh, magnetic fields or anything like that yeah i know the 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 uh, gentleman that i bought the car from had had the uh fuel fuel filter changed so it may have something that's a, that's a good that. possibility sometimes they just don't get mounted correctly because okay. they do have a steel line going to them and you know that's a possibility. That's the one thing I would check for sure. Okay. Yeah, I've, Frank, I've frankly, I'm damn glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> on the on my 500e, I found that the um, isolation mounts for the fuel pump just you know were gone, and so I had okay. to replace those, and that could easily cause your noise. Okay. May, may, I, may I just drop drop in here? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the car should have a filter in the tank too. And and sometimes because of the new fuels we have now with the ethanol in it, uh, not to get into all this now, but I have actually had cars where this filter in the tank has been almost clogged up and the fuel pumps, they make a terrible noise, like a real winding noise when, when this happens. Okay. Now, this is more just like a low frequency hum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, you don't notice it when you're underway so much, you know, but, you know, just the road noise seems to, but you definitely hear it if you're sitting at idle. Yeah, it's probably fuel pump, like Danny yeah. says. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. Thanks, gentlemen. Okay. Next yes, question sir. by Lee Gaiman. My 95 SL500 has never leaked and the top works fine. I have never had the spare tire out to look at the pump and reservoir. I live in Vancouver, which is generally a cooler climate. Should I just leave everything alone? I'm not a do-it-yourselfer. Well, you know, I would, I would, you know, probably look at the reservoir level, but if you don't see fluid leaking, it's not going to go anywhere anyway, and it's operating fine you're probably okay, but you know, every once in a while, I kind of want to look. All right. Um, another question, should the hydraulic fluid be replaced since it is full of dissolved seals? How do you do that? And there, is there a filter or something? I think that gets back to uh, what we talked yeah, about we between me and Danny on the previous one. We don't normally change this fluid. You know, remember, it's not like brake fluid where it's getting you know, absorbing water and changing the boiling point. It's not like motor oil where you've got combustion product, byproducts getting into it and contaminating it. So as long as you keep it 
uh, you know, as long as it's the right fluid, uh, you should be okay. And Danny well, mentioned there's that little filter that's in the top of the reservoir as well. I believe they, they were trying to mention if you have a compromised seal, if there's like part particulates of the seal that would travel through the fluid. So generally, you know, I'm going to chime in too. If you're going to be replacing any of these cylinders, you may as well just change the fluid too. Well, it turns out, you know, when you're changing the cylinders, you end up with, you know, all the fluid, you lose all the fluids in the cylinder, you lose all the fluid that comes out when you pull the lines off. And, you know, you effectively get a, a fairly significant change of it anyway. Yes. Okay. So, so the point to that is, I don't know that there's actually any particulates that are in and that going through the system. I think it's a matter of more of these seals are swelling to the point where they won't seal anymore. I don't think it's actually, when you take them apart, you don't actually see a chip or a chunk taken out of the rubber. Um, so I don't know if there's actually any particulates going through there. And I, I was thinking, you know, when we addressed this a few minutes ago, how would we exchange the fluid in the system if somebody wanted it done? I don't know how to do, I wouldn't know how to do that other than taking the pump out and literally just dumping it out and putting new fluid in and re-bleeding the whole system out. So it's, yeah. it would be a, not complicated, but it, you would, I don't know if it's something that you would want you know necessarily want to do but hey well, what i, I did um this is dean what i did i just sucked it yeah. out replaced okay. it good cycled idea. a few times sucked it out again and replaced that's it. a good idea that's a good idea and that seemed to work pretty well yeah, okay. yeah you that's could actually power. calculate when you've got to change using a dilution ratio calculation if you really wanted to you know but like i say most of us don't do that <laughs> all right a few more questions um Simon is asking can you mention how to lower the top manually without damage to the cylinders and does the unit self bleed if you accidentally run low on fluid yeah it does self bleed uh, once you operate it a few times as far as you know most of the time what you're doing is raising the top manually by uh, lowering the top manually but if you look in the owner's manual there's a procedure to raise the top manually and you basically undo that uh, to lower the tap manual. You have to have the little tool that's in the, the uh, toolkit of the car to uh, one end of it has a little Allen on it that allows you to operate the latches for the, the front windshield cylinders. And the other end of it has the slot that allows you to operate the to no lock and the two bow locks. And I'll caveat that by saying, and as I said in the talk, that on the 95 and newer cars, the brackets on the bow locks aren't there and the access holes in the trunk interior aren't there. You can still operate them. The tool doesn't fit and you've got to pull out the interior of the trunk to operate those bow latches. And so it's a little bit of a pain, but it can be done. And I've even uh, taken off a hard top before totally manually. You can do it. It's easier on 94 and earlier. And we did. And this have is Simon. Uh, I just wanted to follow up to that. The question I had was that if you were going to lower the top manually to service one of the cylinders, I didn't want to, like you said, create some kind of back pressure and uh, cause damage to the other cylinders. Well, my recommendation would be to use it, use it in the automatic function to get it uh, all the way down, and then uh, manually bring it up to the position you need it in. But don't operate it quickly, operate it very slowly. You know, you're, you're holding it, you're pulling it and you're you know, bringing up the weight of it as well as opposing the hydraulic cylinders. So don't try to do it very quickly. You visualize where the hydraulic oil is it's going. It's going around the cylinder seals and you don't want it to try to do that very quickly. So be very gentle with it. Thank you. And I believe that's all the questions we have, Gary. Okay. Anybody else have anything before we close? Okay. If not, um, you know, give me a call if you got it, got issues with this. I've, I've talked through some people. I know when, uh, you know, I've kind of gave a short version of this brief before to folks trying to, to do this for the first time, but like, I just encourage you to, to do your own top cylinder replacement. It's really 
it's really something that you can do and you'll probably only do it once uh, for one of these cars. I thank each of you for being here today. I thank Danny for his help in getting me through this uh, and Ruben for doing the technical pieces and Dean for adding his pieces to it as well. And each of you that contributed, thank you very much. Please, uh, we're trying to do about a monthly tech session. Some of them are in person, some of them are via Zoom. We'll put it out and you're, you're welcome at any of them. Thank you.